Welcome to our Compose Cast, where we discuss productivity, self-hosting, career professionalism, and innovative technology. Here to bring you the latest from the open source ecosystem and beyond is yours truly, Andrew Syriac, and with me is my co-host, Jack Moore. How you doing today, Jack? I'm doing well. I had to confirm. I'm still confirming here. My uh, audacity is coming through. It looks like it is. And I, ha- I don't know if you saw, I also had to spit that Tic Tac I-, I was chewing on out of my mouth. It's actually just sitting on my desk right now. Kind of gross, but I'm doing well over here. How are you doing? Disgusting. It is hot over here. I'll tell you that. It's hot and it is, it is humid out here. I'm just trying to get through this day. I wish I had a better. I, I I'm I'm reevaluating. Should I go down into the basement and just set up down there because it's going to be cool down there. Sure. And then like in the winter, I could I could buy a couple Bitcoin miners and then I could just be the heater for the house. Like, yeah. A little bit more energy consumption with that, but not out of the question, right? I'll I'll talk to my landlord see what he thinks about that. Talking about digging down into the foundation. You linked an article that you had talked about last episode uh, about organizational debt. It being like technical debt, but worse. I briefly touched on organizational debt kind of as a teaser last episode, mentioning it right after our discussion of uh, technical debt. And this is the article I had in my mind uh, when we were talking about last week. I put it up in the show notes and... Just to give kind of a synopsis of this article, I kind of want to read some, there are some parts I had picked out that I wanted to read here. Uh, It was mostly around startups and growth and just kind of jumping in. Startups focus on speed since they're burning cash every day and as they search for product market fit. But over time, code and hardware written and built to validate hypotheses and find early customers can be unwieldy, difficult to maintain and incapable of scaling. These shortcuts add up and become what is called technical debt. That's kind of what we touched on last week, that technical debt aspect. Uh, And the size of the problem, so increases with the success of the company. So you fix technical debt by refactoring, going through existing code, cleaning it up, restructuring it. This works fine. Basically, it adds no features visible to the user, but it makes the code stable and understandable. While technical debt is an understood problem, it turns out startups also accrue another kind of debt one that can kill the company even quicker organizational debt and then it kind of it kind of goes into uh an example of a founder here and uh it sounded like an advisor almost walking through kind of some of these organizational debt issues and just to kind of highlight them really the one that sticks out is training new hires Uh, on both culture and job-specific tasks and retraining existing hires who are working for intern-like salaries, as they say, with little equity. So it looked like, I I don't know if they used a hyper example. Uh, It sounded like the founder of this one was kind of focusing on all the wrong things like new buildings and, you know, new chairs and new furniture, uh, which I didn't really like. But it sounded like the crux of the problem was basically at you're taking a company and you're doubling it in size. You're going from 100 to 200. And guess what? The new people coming on are getting better salaries and maybe more maybe more equity. I, I want to hesitate on equity. But they're coming in and then you have these old people that have been with the company already there kind of looking saying, hey, you know, this isn't fair to us. Why are these, why are the new people getting all this cool stuff? Why are they getting more money than us? What the heck? And, you know, we were the ones who built it, but basically it comes into this HR type role is what I saw of making sure everyone's on the same page and ensuring that basically a plan is together for this kind of organizational debt. Um, he prescribed some things. He prescribed uh, four items for fixing organizational debt, which I feel like I haven't really described perfectly well. It's basically a problem of culture and uh, scale and growth is what I want to call it. Um, But he prescribes kind of four remedies for it. And I'll just quickly run through them here. Putting together a simple plan for managing the next wave of hires, having the HR do a salary survey, identifying employees they want to keep, Upgrading salaries and equity ASAP, 
uh, considering refactoring some of the original hires uh, in their roles. Some employees don't scale from search to build. Uh, basically, you know, finding where you belong to building where you belong. Um, some of it because they have performance problems or don't fit into a bigger organization. Some may be friends. Leaving them in the same role kind of destroys a sense of what's acceptable performance among the new employees. So uh, that was the whole of the article, kind of what I took away from it. I don't know if I liked the way it was described because I think uh, it's a lot harder to um, you know, refactor culture than it is to refactor code, if that makes sense. Yes, I would agree with that. What did you uh, think of it? So the first thing I want to po- point out, right, and, and this is kind of the caveat that I'm coming to this article with, is that if you look in one of the early paragraphs, they were talking about how they, the company, were trying to maintain the company's exponential growth and told me how many people they were adding and the issues of scaling that rapidly. They had doubled the headcount from 100 to 200 in the last year and were planning to double That's, again, right? You're basically and adding in, a new in, organization. Well, in terms of dollars, they were going from 40 million to 80 million, maybe even 100 million yeah. in revenue. Right? So this is what can be termed as as a hyperscale company, right? This is something where, in my mind, tech has really run amok, right? This is, first of all, this is ad revenue. So you would expect that a lot of these dollars are coming in from questionable business decisions. Uh, and, and I have something to back that up later too. Um, but just the idea of a a hyperscaler, right, period, is is odd. I'm, I'm going to put in the show notes. There's a podcast called Above Board. And it, two guys, Jack and Paul, who started Fathom. Uh, and it's, I'm not sure if it's like a, a, a CDN kind of thing or like a CDN for JavaScript or it's, it's like a web, hosted web framework stuff like that, right? And they... They went in their latest episode into how they set up the company. And, and they, they're doing basically what we're doing with their podcast. They, they're figuring stuff out. So they say they figure out live on the air how they want to approach bringing more people in to work on the core product and integrations, right? So, so this, is, this is a great background for an actual company who's doing this. However, they're coming at it from the different approach, right? They also cover the VC versus non-VC debate and where Fathom's operating philosophy fits, right? So in, in, in the episode, they come to the conclusion that their operating philosophy is if we don't have to, we don't want to try to hyperscale. We want to be able to do stuff in a sustainable type of way, and we want to be profitable from day one. We don't want to rely on this burning cash while we create a product to get things going. And that really leads into a type of perpetual startup culture, right, where where you're able just to do whatever you want because the money doesn't matter, right? And in the long run, that is not sustainable, Right. We've proven time and time again that that is not sustainable, even within the hyperscale company, Facebook, Google. How many times do they keep killing lines of businesses off because they don't become profitable? Right. You may pretend that it doesn't matter, but in the end, it absolutely matters where the profit's coming from and is it sustainable? So there, there is a mentality of, hey, if you're not able to float yourself along while you're starting something up. And, and luckily enough, we've been able to do just that, right? The two of us individually, as we're, we're working on this, we've been able to, to do our, our day jobs as we focus on uh, getting this off the ground and, and getting it to a, to usable, you know, point to, to, to a point where it's bringing value uh, to, to people, you know, bringing, bringing that value that, that we expect it to. And, there are some people who, who can't, right? There are some people who have to pour everything they have in there. And in that case, taking on debt, taking on money is okay, right? But, I mean, if you look, you know, Ben Franklin, neither borrower nor lender be. I mean, he's talking about debt there. You know, you have 
Uh, there's there's plenty of places, even in even in uh, scripture, right? Even in the Bible, that will tell you having debt is not a good thing. Owing someone is not a good thing. Having that in the back of your mind, you look at, you know, the the student debt crisis. You look at, you know, the housing debt crisis. You know, all these debt crises should be a big red flag for us to say, hey, maybe debt is not the way to structure an economy, <laughs> right? Maybe having a sustainable model is going to be more beneficial in the long run than factoring something over top of exponential growth right. and and valuations of companies rather than actual earning statements. So I default to the approach of don't take on debt, whether that's monetary, whether that's technical, or whether that's organizational. If you're going to do something, you know, do it, do it right. It's, it's worth taking the time to do it right. Right. Yeah. It's uh, I don't know if I have a good analogy here. It's like, uh, you know, you're building a fire, right? And the sustainable way to go would be just, you know, slowly add kindling in at, you know, manage it properly. Going the uh, route of debt is, uh, kind of like dumping a gasoline on a forest and lighting on fire and then going oh wait this is way too much hang on we need to like scale this way back just to where our fire pit not to the fire pit but to a controlled controlled area before this gets out of hand exactly exactly so i mean it's you you're just not and and i'm trying to find the the article that i was reading earlier but it's like you know the 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 ad revenue for big businesses is is net not very good sure. on on net the, the the ad revenue is not returning what you would expect it to right and and i think we've at least had this conversation before i know me and my roommate have but what really is is advertisement in a type of environment that we find ourselves in right is is that content marketing you know putting actual value out right is that ads inside of social media right or is that content inside of social media or is it both right so i mean there's a there's a much larger discussion about really what does ad revenue represent and and i'm more so inclined to think that it represents the moneyed interests of the economy more so than actual genuine products that people right. don't don't know about and, right. and if you think about the product discovery cycle too right becoming aware of it is just the very first step the most most people are going to spend the bulk of their time circling around the forming an opinion around who you are what you represent what you stand for etc cetera, etc cetera, as they as they find out more and more about what you are maybe that's five minutes of their time but for those five minutes is going to be revolving around looking at yeah what do you have any social proof um do you have any uh you know risk reversals do you have any of the uh, same priorities or or the same philosophies that that we do right do we share anything you know so so finding out that about different companies, different products is much more advantageous than than simply onboarding. Onboarding comes, and really the most effective onboarding that you're going to get is through word of mouth, period, hands down. Definitely. That's why that's why social media was, was such a big promise because social media was, hey, it's going to look like it's coming from their best friends, right? Well, turns out, one, no one's anyone's best friend on Facebook, and two – we all know what an ad looks like right. and hate seeing them. So I, I don't trust ad revenue and I don't trust taking on debt. Right now they do make several good points about organizational debt inside of, of here. Um, and they, they, those points are the ones that I, that, that make the most sense when you stack them up against technical debt. It's going in, cleaning up code by restructuring it, right? Um, organal debt is all about the people slash culture compromises made to just get it done in the early stages of a startup. I would even say you can you can expand that to say 
to, to years of people with the same mentality, you know, a just get it done mindset right. is always going to lead to shortcuts. Right. And, and especially if that culture never, never got dissipated, right. If, if the, the culture is still like that, is still that way. If you're still a firefighter, no, you're, you're never going to scale. You're never going to multi, you're never going to be a full force multiplier. You're always going to scale linearly. And that means you're going to have to add more people. Right. And and that just doesn't that doesn't scale when you talk about, you know, using technology either, because the more you scale, the more people are going to be using disparate situ- or solutions. Right. So you're going to have to corral them all into using one cookie cutter product. And then you got to have a team to manage that cookie cutter product. Right. It's it just it just doesn't work. Right. So so you have to go change the culture. And I, I, I think they did talk about that. The other thing that I saw second to last four points were the main ones, which we, which the first one talks about the culture. Um, uh, the, the, the second one talks about communication. How do you communicate? Right. Communication is very key, um, especially not just communicating like here's the quarterly updates. Right. Being able to say where are you at in the process? You know, are we going to make the feature deadline, right? Stuff, stuff like that, you know, internal job status communication, as well as normalizing communication in between individuals or teams uh, and corporate communication as well. Like, I mean, there you, you still have three levels of, of figuring that out, but communication is always going to be key, right? But it's going to change versus, I mean, they, they say perfectly here, now that the company no longer fits in a conference room or even the cafeteria, it needs a way to disseminate information that grows with the organization, right? Email blasts still work. Go figure. Totally. But it's not going to be as hands-on and it's not going to be as catered to the audience as it was before, right? So whereas you could have really custom tailored a speech to a, a group of people that you knew where they were coming from, you start talking to what were they saying? 200 people. That's too many, too many points of view to really give it an effective speech for just by sheer numbers alone. The third one, does customer communication need to change? I really don't have any experience with that. Um, I know that it has been a struggle, especially when you have little snowflakey type ways of handling people and i just know that that's never going to scale like not only is it never going to scale it's also going to be prone to misinterpretation right. and just other general mistakes because if you if you don't have a way to put a framework around something or at least say in this situation we probably want to default to approaching it from this point of view if you're just winging it the entire time that's going to be prone to to miscommunication as well so that's that's never good uh and then the last one here which was interesting to me because this is something that that jason does talk about all the time jason stapleton if you haven't heard his uh show is his podcast is the jason stapleton show i would highly recommend it Uh, but he has a big thing about look at, at at some point you hit a scale ceiling right and and to break through you're going to have to bring on people who have who who know that next level, right? Because the people who got you to the top of that first level aren't going to know the next level, right? right? Uh, and 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 you saw it in the example that they used in the article. The example was that we had a uh, VC and we had a you know uh, VP and and all these other people on the board who were good at getting startups, you know, getting, getting a product market fit, you know, getting a burn down chart accurate, you know, getting, getting it off the ground, right? Once it's off the ground though, how do you take it to the next level, right? Once it's, once it's there, once it's reached the the top of that, right? The build stage, they call it, how do you get it to the, the growth stage, right? Um, and, and, and to, to turn this to, to talk about, you know, what, we want to do with this. I, I don't foresee us ever really hitting this problem, this, this scenario, at least. I mean, we, right. Right. We could, we could experience organizational debt in smaller chunks, right? Especially the processes and procedures that we sure. go through. I mean, right now we meet once a quarter. Can't do that all the time, especially if we do end up scaling to, you know, 
more than five to six people all kind of working on this thing. Right. If we have anything more than that, that becomes in, in, not that's not feasible anymore. So what do you do then? And well, then you got to re- rethink and, you know, where do you want to go from there? But we're not going to have any kind of a hyperscaling problem because that's not how we work. Operate, right? Right. That's 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 not what the basis of this business is 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 about. I mean, this is this is definitely more so like what what Fathom has where they're not taking VC money. Right. They're building something that is immediately profitable. Right. And something that is highly connected with their customers. I mean, this is something that's that we have a a very good idea of who we're going to be working with and, and, and their needs and how they need to operate and and how we can help them uh, going forward. You know, it's it's not going to be a name lit list faceless entity right, out right. there that we're serving i mean these are these are really real people that we're looking at helping so i would say with that being said do you have anything to close on i do have a pretty good uh intro into our next intro topic no go for it uh with this being said and taking on money what did you think of element taking on 30 million from investors to build out matrix yes yeah, they uh, closed their Series B funding. Yeah. Uh, in order to focus, they say here uh, on the app's usability. They actually say revolutionize the app's usability. Man, I hope not. Don't revolutions are bloody and messy, and just make it better. Um, they also said they wanted to build out major new features, expand in the enterprise market, and take Matrix fully mainstream, uh, which is fine for me uh i I, i'm i i can i can totally back that i got no problems with that um so it looks like there are people who are continuing uh to they say quote double down on their existing investments in element that's good yeah I'm, i'm happy to see the people who started it are still excited about the project i think they've been coming along pretty well i don't I don't see why they would start losing steam now. I, I got, I got no problem seems here. Seems like more and more, all they are is gaining steam. Honestly, it seems like everyone's mm-hmm. kind of switching over. Uh, they highlighted a few. I don't have it right in front of me here. Here we go, right here. Uh, let's see. In the public sector, more and more governments and non-government organizations, hopefully to be announced soon, are joining the UK, the US, France, and Germany in building on Matrix. And then they talked about, you know, I think we already discussed it. Germany's healthcare system, or not not system. Germany's healthcare. I don't know if it was providers. Uh, all of Germany's healthcare will use Matrix going forward. So it just seems everywhere you look, it's being adopted. I got nothing but you know best wishes for them. Now they're. I still don't think they're a public company. Um, I think that Series B means they're still private. Right. Um. So that's. That's fine with me. I, I at least like to see that. Um, but thirty million to me sounds like a lot of money. There are a lot of open source developers that are not getting thirty million dollars. No, definitely not. I don't. I don't necessarily know what to make of this. I'm. I'm happy with the tech. I'm. I'm not a hundred percent happy with chat as I've detailed out previously. But it seems like as an alternative to everything else that's out there, I would rather have this than not. We'll see. Uh, we'll we'll see if uh, I'd be interested to see on how the other federated services are managing funding, because I know the other the other services, you know, Mastodon. You got the SoundCloud replacement. Everything else that's out there, right? How 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 are you how are you getting funding? Is it is it all donations? Are you actually providing a service, or is it VC led? I would hope it's the second, but my fear is that it's more of a mix of the first and third. In which case, you run into the problem, like we were talking about with the lean startup. I mean, you're not going to be able to get a in. in analyze cycle right. in there you can't see with real dollar feedback what is valuable and what's not so at that point your priorities can be all over the place right you you you, you have no way to successfully prioritize so if if you can't 
prioritize based on money, what do you prioritize and buy? And that ends up being politics, right? You're, you're prioritizing based on who can complain the loudest. And that becomes very problematic, especially in an open source ecosystem where everyone is performing based on goodwill. I, I do like the fact that they do have customers, right? And that the, their customers are driving. I've seen in several different comments and several different issues, look, this isn't, this just isn't something that people who are using the software in an enterprise environment need right now. So we're going to not prioritize this and pri prioritize other things, right? Because that is where the money's coming from, right? Um, uh, unless you have this VC money, and then you're like, well, now what gets prioritized? Right. So we'll see. We'll see how this goes. Um, like I like I've said, I mean, Element Matrix uh, have just been picking up steam, uh, hand over fist. So I'm. I'm interested to see where it goes. I just hope that they can stay and you can you can you can stay true to your priorities with with good leadership. Uh, and and I think that's what they've been blessed to have. I mean, I, I think the leadership in in element, you know, has has been really, really good. Um, I, I think they have been able to steer this correctly. Right. But as we just went over with organizational debt. I mean, the bigger you get, the harder that becomes. You can't corral everyone all the time. When you have a a swath of people go off on a tangent right. that is not necessarily aligned with where you want the company to go, I mean, are you going to have the clout to be able to wrangle them back in? If not, then what happens? E either, either you have to be forced monetarily to have them change direction, right? Or risk losing control of the company. And that is way too doomsday for this kind of situation where this is going on really well, right? Right. I, I just don't want to see that happen. I, I can I can see where that would end up coming into play, and, and I just don't want to see us even start down that road. So let's get some customers in here. Let's get some people paying. Um like like we said, and and I mean this may be a while back we were talking about this but um everything that we get we we plan to earmark uh, a percentage of that for upstream projects right a every every project we host based on the percentage of, of how it's utilized and what is actually being paid for i mean part of our our plan is to to earmark that money for the upstream development of the projects right because we believe that we are a customer of those projects Right. Because of the way that they, they're able to be self-hosted, right? Um, now, I know Bitwarden hosts its own thing as they make their source open open source. You know, um, Nextcloud uh, has, has the same thing, right? And, and we would like to add into that ecosystem this alternative, right? We believe this is a viable alternative, and we believe that this is the way that we provide the avenue for productivity in the real world using open source software i'm completely ready to be a customer of these guys and let them let them know exactly what needs to be a priority and speaking of that man we are just rolling right into these we have some community community news and updates here so uh just to jump into it instead of dive we're jumping uh first one off here is uh vault warden 1.22.2 was released you know what? I'll come out and say there wasn't anything too noticeable with this. I wanted to include it just as an update there. Uh, it was released three days ago. Um, updated the web vault to 2.21.1, enforcing two-factor authentication policy in organizations, which will kind of be interesting to see. I don't know. I didn't look into that and what that means. I don't know if that means organizations are now going to be forced to use two-factor. Probably the ability to enforce 2FA for everyone within the organization, I would okay. guess. Okay. We'll see. Uh, protecting send routes against possible path traversal attack, disabling show password hint by default, which I like that one. I, I mean, that's a good, that's a good one. I don't, you know, if it's, if it's your instance, you should know the password to it now. Shouldn't need the hint. It can still be enabled. Okay. So with that, it can still be enabled. 
uh, disabling user verification yeah. enforcement in WebAuthn, which would make some users unable to log in, uh, fixing some other WebAuthn uh, items there. So really just, again, Danny Garcia, I think, is the maintainer. Nothing we need to just, belabor, basically. Yeah, push it, push it forward. The next one up here is Dan Brown, six years. He said he's quitting his yeah, he said he's quitting his current job. He's taking a six month break to work strictly on Bookstack before he starts looking for more work. So this was this next this next article here is just kind of highlights and goes into six years of Bookstack. It he said it's been six years since his original commit in twenty fifteen and just kinda throws a few shout outs out there and then I really like how he kind of puts his metrics out there. Uh, it, I don't know if you have the article open or not. He says book stack and numbers a year later, and he has the increases and decreases of numbers, and he has it kind of broken out and highlighted. It. GitHub figures, code repository stats, social and Docker, and then website analytics. And then the last one is uh, crowd in project translation numbers. What's your uh, hot take on this? I love how transparent he is with it, honestly. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's really nice. If you look at all these numbers, it's it's absurd to me he isn't doing this full time. It just seems like with all the growth he's had with it, it seems like something he would be able to do full time. But the one that really stuck out to me, 76 million Docker Hub pools. And he's it's up 31 million. So to me that's that's the number that and that means nothing, right? Cuz you know, you can pull on anything, but that number just means I, I think it kind of indicates people are using it. Seventy six million. Uh, I can't fathom that. Yeah, that's huge. That's almost that's double, almost double what he had before per his yeah. his metrics here. Yeah. So yeah, that's, up a hundred percent. Yeah. That's, you know whether that's CI/CD pipelines, whether that's this or that, it means people are using it. That's yeah. crazy cool, crazy cool. Yeah. What what else is up? What what's up next? So that one, uh, and then we have here uh, the Firefly three is vulnerable to improper restriction of excessive authentication attempts. So basically, this is just a tweet from the Firefly three account that kind of just indicates you can brute force attack Firefly three and you can get you can get in. <laughs> it's kind of what I was. That's kind of how I interpreted it. They left link the uh, what is it the miter link to it, but basically here we go right here. Firefly 3.5.5.12 is vulnerable to improper restriction of excessive authentication attempts. You know, colon. Uh, a malicious user can spam the login form to brute force the login. 5.5.13 will be released the beginning of next week to remediate this. So, Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, I found it very interesting just because I, I, you, you don't hear about brute force attacks. You do hear about brute force attacks, but, you know, them just admit, you know, putting it out there and going, yep. We're vulnerable to this. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to think about it. The uh, last update here is uh, WordPress 5.8, which I don't know if you saw this. It was named Tatum. And really, WordPress, I would say going all out, honestly, on pushing forward with web UI. Everything's managed through widgets and blocks now. You're able to display posts with new blocks and patterns and then a little bit around templating basically there were they're just going up it, it, widgets and blocks is the way i understand it just making what you see is what you get to the next level would you say they're they're going all out on the web ui is that yeah the way to edit and update pages uh, it sounds like you can very easily find a start uh what is it what's the a front page or a, a landing page theme it, i should say you can build one a lot easier than you can pick a theme out um, so making it a lot easier to navigate and build with blocks is what I would say. As long as it still continues to work. So we'll do our integration testing and do the upgrade. To make a note of that, we'll go to 5.7. Eventually we'll hit 5.8 and 5.9 and keep marching uh, right ahead as the rest of the community seems to be doing. I mean, we, we just, we have more and more that continue to roll out. Yeah. Uh, and we have some of our own as well. Yeah, I'll tell you what. I have the dev site up. I have the one there, but do you want to talk on yours? I, I it, it wasn't included in there. It needs to be included in there. Do you want to talk about the uh, commands receivable? So, yeah, the, the commands receivable was something that we had talked about implementing earlier, wherein 
any given instance is able to run the Ansible playbooks that you would normally run from a command and control server on itself. Now, th this has tons of logistical roadblocks. To, you know, how, how are you going to be doing this? You know, where where is this going to be taking place? How do you not expose just a plethora of vulnerabilities by doing this, et cetera, et cetera. So we, with the, the following understanding that portal is going to be deployed as part of the instance, because that's, that's part of the definition of, of what makes what we do itself, right? I mean, it's, this, this is, this is portal running on it, being able to manage the instance after us having put uh, the environment and being able to modify the environment on there. We said, okay, now, um, as a result of that, we can now use the environment that is local to kick off an Ansible run um, because we have all the, the plays up on, on GitHub, uh, the plays and the scripts, everything, um, or GitLab and GitHub, I guess. Uh, and, and we say, all right, how do we do this? Well, first of all, we're already using containers and containers are the best way to create a reproducible environment anywhere. So let's just continue to do that. The first initial, you know, knee-jerk reaction would be to say, let's just expose the Docker socket to the portal instance. Right. And that way we can have portal call directly a Docker socket with, or a, a, a Docker container, or, or, you know, a command inside of a Docker container through uh, just the, the, the portal interface. And, you know, after, after stepping back and we said, that's just insecure. Like it, it, it for for a right, number of reasons right. for any number of ways you can break out of that, especially with you know being able to run almost nothing on the server as long as you still have access to that socket you can get pretty much anywhere through any number of a series of hacks. So we decided against doing that, but I still like the idea of a socket in order to communicate with outside of the container because well what are your alternatives i could throw something in a in a text file onto the container and then i can have like a cron job on the host running and, and looking inside the container to see if that file is there and what are its contents and then run something but that's not responsive that's subject to a huge delay it could be minutes until something runs right so we had to figure out how to get portal to communicate to the outside host in a responsible manner that was input sanitized. Right? So what we ended up doing is spawning a systemd socket, and that systemd socket listens to a socket whose other end of the connection is exposed inside a portal, uh, which now means that portal can send data through the socket, and systemd will, will see that data, and spin up a corollary service. And that service is literally just a Python script that it passes the data to. And now we have now we have a system wherein Portal can call something that passes data to a program running as a privileged user on the host. That program then is able to say, all right, is this something I should execute? And we can have all the logic in there that we need to, to say, hey, you're allowed to do this, this, and this, but nothing else, right? So we're able to restrict what actual commands are able to be run on the host. And, and it's something we can expand later on. This is something that's, that's very flexible. It's a very flexible way to implement this. Since that command is going to be on the host and going to be intercepting all the communication over that socket that ex is exposed to, to portal, it's just sitting there and waiting to receive the, the, uh, the JSON payload that we have uh, being sent over the socket. So now we have a way to run privileged commands through a container that is not exposing the Docker, Docker socket onto that container. And we're able to do that in a way where we're able to sanitize the input and say, hey, let's run this through our Python script, which as something that was very fun to write and, and be able to deal with, you know, how, how do I accept the file descriptor from the 
the system D socket, how does that hand that off? Um, how do I use the Docker uh, library, the Docker Pi library, right, to to call a brand new container run inside of a Python script? Um, and then how do I stream the output of that back through the socket? Because here's the cool thing is that a socket is bi-directional. Were I to throw something in a file and, and have the host pick it up or, or any really right. type of asynchronous communication, what I would be ending up with doing is, is kicking off a, a process blindly and not being able to get any kind of a feedback, right? What we're able to do here is from inside of the container – kick off that process and then once that process kicks off i'm being fed a stream of output data that is now parsable by the calling program right so so that being completed the next step in this uh, what what jack and i are talking about doing is saying all right now you can parse that stream input we can provide real-time feedback onto the web page that says hey your uh, health checks are currently being ran or, you know, we are currently he self healing, you know, this container. And, and now we have a process for uh, a, a container to manage other containers without having the Docker socket exposed. And, and I, I think this was just a, a really, you know, I, I did a really deep dive into some esoteric blog posts and stack overflow questions um, and and really really had to dig deep. The one the one problem that I encountered that really stymied me is that the Docker Pi uh, virtual environment uh, has a shell redirect. So what you're calling for the Python executable is actually a Bash script that calls the Python executable. What happens when you do that is you don't pass in the environment. You actually pass in. Uh, you, you create a, a subshell by doing that. And that subshell will not have any of the environment variables. Therefore, it will not have any of the file descriptors for that socket. So when system D calls that executable, it will not know what socket it's supposed to read off of. And that took me like two days to figure out. That was frustrating. Uh, once I got that figured out, though, everything went, went smooth as butter. Uh, and now we've got real-time output streamed back to the calling function inside of the container. Yeah. So, and while Jack works on that, um, I'll be working on putting together a Docker container uh, so we don't have to like rebuild a, a Docker container every, every time, time or, right. or at least cache what we have. So we're able to, to get that spun up really quick in the sense of health checks. I mean, a health check run should take five seconds, right? So what I would hopefully like to have happen is a, is a container spun up, health checks run against the host, container spun down. And there's a lot more behind the scenes uh, to that, like, you know, host-based networking, uh, using SSH keys to talk to the host and, and, and stuff like that. Everything's going to be in the, uh, in the merge request, which I will link in the show notes. Uh, but I was, I was very happy to eventually get that completed. I, I have a, uh, couple items I'm looking into and uh, one of them actually is in fact using a Ruby library to start to send data to the stream and then parse it back you know so I'm excited to see get a little proof of concept out there uh, to get it working with our portal application and then just to add on that uh, another small one here uh, I think the way Andrew and I discussed it, we're moving towards a dashboard-based application uh, for Portal. So just kind of the first step on that is putting a logon page on just right on your landing page there. So instead of seeing a list of applications, you're just going to see the a logon form. Uh, and then there are a couple other buttons there, you know, for logging in. And then say forget your password, which sometimes we do that. A uh, form and page for, you know those helper functions is what's out there. So the title of this week's episode, everything is a nail kind of, kind of, I want to kind of want to explain it here. Just as the, uh, every, uh, warden what was last week's episode. Every warden has a vault and every warden blocks the, yeah. <laughs> something like that. What does the warden guard your passwords? <laughs> warden guards the vault. <laughs> Talking about tools this week, talking about tools and reports. And so I had to, you know, 
whenever tools come up, you always think of a hammer. And if you're holding a hammer, everything's a nail. I don't know what that has to do with tools and reports. I just think, you know, if your only tool is a hammer, then all you're going to want to hit is nails. So, yeah, you know, if you if you want to save a private key somewhere and all you have is Bitwarden, you're going to use Bitwarden to, to save that key as an attachment because you have that tool. I think that is a personal anecdote from quite literally <laughs> us because I did that. Anyway, jumping into Bitwarden tools, just high level overview uh, in the Bitwarden tools section features such as how your password get generated, importing data, exporting data and pulling reports are available for, I said, customizing your instance. This is not, you're not customizing your instance with this. You're just, this, these are tools. If you want to dive more into customizing the instance, I'd recommend checking out settings, which we will cover. We are definitely going to cover, but really just kicking it off here. And to be honest with you, I have not used the password generator from Bitwarden's web UI. So the page I have pulled up on the documentation here is quite literally a password manager. And this sounds crazy, but you can select, you know, password or passphrase. Okay, fine. Uh, with password, you can choose the length, the minimum numbers, the minimum special, you know, A to Z caps, A to Z minimum, A to Z lower, zero to nine. Basically, you know, special characters, avoid ambiguous characters. Okay, that's just a password generator, right? But the one thing I found interesting, I don't know, do you use the passphrase? I have once. You? I am not a passphrase guy. I have more of just a password guy. So the reason I use the passphrase is when I went to rekey my password on a lot of my machines. I think I was setting this uh, mini one up at the time. Um, I knew that I would be using 1Password for... Basically everything. Do you use one password for all your machines? I use the same password for both of my machines. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then that's that drops me into a session uh, because it's also the uh, disk encryption password. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So my just like a just like a a Mac. Right, my disk encryption password is my user password. Now, sure. In a Mac, those can actually be different if you don't sync them up, and that causes issues, as I found out in the past with a Mac. Um, it wouldn't really cause an issue with with Linux the way I have it set up, but you know, it is just nice to have it like that, so I don't have to remember more than that. Right. Um, I do have actually a different one to get into my. Uh, Bitwarden instance, um, but for for my machines, my passphrase is the same, and I did create a passphrase over a password out of out. Yeah, I did create a passphrase from a generator. Really, and the worst part is how many? It's really cool. Like it's oh, a really cool and deep, meaningful phrase. Okay, and I'm just like I can never share this so you, with anybody. You can remember it exactly. Is it Hunter exactly. too? It is not. Okay. It doesn't even have okay. I, any of those letters in it. I figure we use... Uh, Actually, it probably does. I don't know. I figure we get that out there covering passwords here uh, while we can. I don't think it had been mentioned the past couple episodes. But, no, I walk through... Basically, I do not use this web UI. I always use the generator on the uh, add-on on Firefox or wherever. Just, Ditto. you know create a new login you know usually it's just email included and generate password and boom there it is and now that i'm looking uh i i also use the uh one-time password there but password generators out there it's fine it's you know you're not getting anything fancy with it uh the one thing i will note is the history now have you ever had to look back on that history for the password manager or for the password generator on the generator. If you click the little, that little, uh, it looks like a clock. It'll show no, you, I didn't see it'll that. show you all the passwords you've generated. Huh? And that session or like ever do you that know? session? Uh, I'm pretty sure it's that okay. session. I haven't gone okay. back and checked. Yeah. It shows recent history, which I thought 
was kind of weird, honestly, just having that feature there. I know everything's encrypted and safe, but it just and you know they're just at some point you you have to you have to account for people making dumb decisions right because i do that all the time i've lost bitcoin due to a dumb decision i literally had to email the guys and say oh have my bitcoin because i lost my keys so i hope you're happy yeah you know that doesn't sound good at all yeah it wasn't it wasn't i I was i was really frustrated about that so i'm happy to see that bitwarden you know does kind of take that into account yeah and then getting into importing data and exporting data uh i don't know have you used these at all or ever had to use them only the initial time i switched from keypass to bitwarden okay how about that so really quick if you don't know imp- importing data is just bringing in data obviously and then the way i really like how bitwarden has this compared to other services uh, especially keypass the bitwarden instance just says it lists off all these services you can import from so i did the same thing as you. I think it was KeePass. I think it was actually KeePass XC or KeePass. Which would be KeePass 2. two. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I imported it in. And the only problem I had was in KeePass 2, uh, if I had notes or additional fields, they did not copy over, which I didn't realize. So you have to be mindful of when you're moving this stuff or if you're moving it or importing it. You have to bring over some of those secure fields if you want them to cross over because you can. There was some the one time when I needed, you know, I don't know if it was recovery or there was basically it wasn't two factor, but it was I needed the node or whatever that was attached with the password as well. And it wasn't there. And luckily I had KeyPass still it's still around on my desktop. Now it's not updated or anything, but I had to re sign in and you know, grab that, grab that old note that I needed. So luckily it wasn't an attachment for uh, production keys, but nonetheless. Well, and I like to see here that they also have Chrome and Firefox because a lot of people yeah. do use a browser. Totally. Just as a password you know, manager. Do you want just, to save this password? Yes. yes. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Uh, and, and so that would be a way to bump your security up, you know, in order to take those out of the browser and put them into Bitwarden. Yeah, and I have exported before for, uh, I'll call it migrating, uh, if you want to call it. But basically, instead of, I I have a self-hosted instance, or an an instance here, and instead of using a uh, container, a volume, like a normal person would, right? I just let the container run. I had to export all the data out and then I spun up the new instance. I did use a volume the second time. And then I put the, I had to re import all the JSON data again and no issues at all with it. But I thought you'd like that little personal anecdote on a bad Docker form right there. The personal anecdote is that you should be using an Archimpose instance, <laughs> hands down. I totally should. We manage that. Yeah. We manage yeah. that. Now, also, I will tell you, I've never exported data. I think you asked earlier, but I have actually gone in and ran a dump of the SQLite database to get all of the relevant information. Okay. So what does that, isn't that encrypted? Did you unencrypt it or did you encrypt, just dump it? No, in? no, no. It's just, just it's, the, da- it's just all the encrypted. SQLite yeah. database file? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You just you just grab that database file, and and honestly, that's what we're doing. Where we're migrating to, we're transferring the SQLite data. That's what that's what's stored yeah. on the volume. That's right. what allows Bitwarden to do the thing that it does. And so, it uh, I was able to run a dump on it, and sure, you know, sure enough, everything's encrypted. Right. Right. Uh, so it it wasn't much help, but I was still able to get in and and take a look at it. That was when I was trying to reverse engineer some of the API stuff. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's, there are plenty of ways to export or even just, you know, um, save your vault in, or, you know, in, in the event of a crash or whatever. Yeah. I mean, this is, it's, it's there, it's not rocket science, what they're doing here. It's, it's basic crypto primitives and, and database primitives. And it just ends up being a really nice tool that can do fancy tricks like exporting your passwords as JSON. Yeah. Now going back to the, uh, 
exporting the data and having it all encrypted. Now in the settings, I won't I won't cover it too much here. I don't know if you could saw it. You can actually I don't know if you saw it. You can actually set where you how many times you want to cycle the password for the cryptography. Uh, yep. I found it interesting that was out there because I know you had mentioned. Oh yeah, you know you're cycling it a hundred thousand times or something, and it was ten thousand times or you know it was something like that. But I was digging through yesterday and I found that very interesting that you can kind of set how secure how secure how many passes you want to make on mm -hmm. for the hash yep. or for the data really all i have for the tools there's nothing crazy going on here that's what i'd say it's password generation it's importing data it's exporting data now reports i found very interesting reports i link back to the upstream documentation um, but essentially, reports are help helpful for changing up passwords, cycling passwords, and updating that may updating anything that may be stale or exposed. You're gonna want to change those if they're bad. Honestly, if you're using weak passwords, if you're using exposed password, if you're reusing passwords, change them. Um, reports can be found right on the tool section, and I'm just gonna jump over to the main documentation here. So exposed, kind of self-explanatory here. Uh, exposed password report identifies passwords that have been uncovered and known data breaches that were released publicly or sold on the dark web by hackers. This report uses a trusted web service to to search the first five digits of the hash of all your passwords in a database of known leaked passwords. I found this very interesting. I didn't know how they went about doing this. I knew they did not just send your password to a database and go, oh, hey, is this exposed? Uh, but their method I really liked, which was uh, if there's a little tip here, it says why use the first five digits of password password hashes if the report and this is their kind of response here. If the report was performed with your actual passwords, it doesn't matter if they were exposed or not. You'll be voluntarily leaking it to the service. The report's result may not mean your individual account has been compromised rather that you are using a password that has been found in these databases in the databases of exposed passwords. However, you should avoid using a leaked and non unique password. Basically, it's taking your password, hashing the first five characters, and then checking the hash of the first five characters in this database to check if anything matches. So it takes the hash, and it looks for the first five digits of the hash. It doesn't take the first five digits of, of your password. It takes the, the first, first five, five of the hash, of the hash yeah, of your password. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. It's, it yep. doesn't take your password. It, it doesn't take your password and hash it. It takes the hash of your password. So I didn't know how they did that. I found that very again very interesting yeah uh obviously next kind of reports here are the uh reuse password report nothing fancy going on with this one basically it checks all the uh identifies all non-unique passwords in your vault again just pat simple i'd say password security is security here don't reuse passwords don't you, you reuse passwords you, just that's don't do that why would you do don't that don't do it uh, reusing the same password for multiple services can allow hackers to easily gain access to accounts. I, I mean, it's just bad practice, right? If you set the same password yep. for every single service, it's not just your yep. email you're going to have to change. It's everything. Yep. Um, next up is weak passwords. Usually these are just known words. You know, I, I assume they go through a uh, database here. Yeah, here you go. So it was it was interesting. I'm I'm not sure if I had said this, but uh, I was over here, and I had to reset my stepdad's password on Nextcloud, and I just set it to change me. Did it allow it? It did not. Uh, Nextcloud did not. It did not. Uh, on Nextcloud, correct. It said that was one of the top a hacked password, thousand or ten thousand yeah common passwords, and to to change it so. I had to change it away from that. But this report here, what you're saying is then that would give me a similar type of report if anyone I'm using, you know, ends up being Hunter 2. And I, I should be it's doing coming that. across the stars to me. But um, no, and I'll tell you what, though, in Bitwarden, because you have that password generator, at least this has been my kind of experience, because the password generator is there and you don't have to think of some kind of random password which guess what humans aren't good at doing it's ends up 
I, I haven't run into any issues. The report for me has come back clean on everything. So kudos to well, me. Well, I mean, I've been using password managers since I knew they were a thing. So like KeePass yeah. and before that, I forget what I was using, but you know, that to Bitwarden for the last good several years and it's been working just fine you know i'm using it for all my passwords so all of them are strong passwords that's a side effect <laughs> i mean it's just good practice honestly yeah. end of the day yeah uh but yeah. this next one i did find different is what i'll say basically it goes through and the unsecured websites report identifies login items that are unsecured http Mm -hmm. uh schemes and uris it's much safer to use https we both know this now granted mentioned in an earlier podcast episode just because it's https does not mean it's actually your bank right it could still be a fake website but it's much safer to use https for encrypt to encrypt communications with uh, tls and ssl the report just comes back and shows you a list of these uris uh, and then basically you should go through and update them from HTTP to HTTP, HTTPS. So the next one, I, I, inactive two-factor authentication. Basically, I didn't understand this one, honestly. This one was um, it identified items with two-factor authentication is available from the service. You don't have a stored uh, TOTP authentication authenticator key. So it sounded like the report from this one was going through finding websites that offer uh, one time or two factor authentication and saying, hey, you can use this to set up uh, two factor is the way I understood it, which again, up until actually a couple of weeks ago, I was using my phone as two factor. But, uh, you know, every time I ran this report, I don't know if it was the links were broken or what was going on, but. I wasn't seeing instructions on setting up for, you know, it looks like in this one they have GitHub identified as one that you can set up for two factor. So I want to explore that one, I guess more, I don't know. It might be something to check out, but even on this most recent uh, report, it didn't return anything for me. Now I, maybe I have something just misconfigured in my uh, Bitwarden instance. Is it, is it a local instance of Bitwarden? No. Uh, uh, Okay. It's online. Okay. Um, and then the data bre breach report here. Uh, you do need keys for uh, for the Have I Been Pwned database to check uh, whether, you know, any of your information, you know, email addresses, passwords, credit cards, date of birth, any of that information has been leaked. Um, we can help you set up keys for this. It's we don't offer a key for all of our customers but if you're if it's something you're interested we'd be happy to help you out with it getting happy to help you get it set up now i ran i did run the report yesterday on myself on for all of these it actually just runs wrong the way i kind of understood it uh i ran all five but it looks like it runs one and then based off the one it checks all of them so it, it runs one and then it'll show green for all of them and then uh it shows a nice little uh, good news. No items in your vault have passwords that have been exposed and no data breaches. So, you know, you get a nice little pop-up for each report, essentially. Um, but that's all I had for tools and reports. I would highly recommend to anyone just to check it out. You know, it's worth cycling through updating passwords and it, it's just good security practice. It's just good practice in general. It doesn't even have to be security practice. Um, I know a lot of people out there do use one password for everything. I'm sitting here. I'm going to tell you that's a terrible thing to do. That's just not, not the way to go. But do you have anything you'd like to add for Bitwarden tools and reports? Check out the integration discussion. Uh, check out the integration video Andrew has out there. Sounds like he covers some, uh, dropped yesterday. Tools. Yeah. <laughs> Still got that new video smell. All right. I, to be fair, I hadn't gone through those, um, except maybe the, the password generator and importing the data once. But um, good to know about those reports and uh, interested to see if I, I, 
I know my password will be strong, but, um, you know, I don't know what I don't know. So I don't know if something has been compromised. Right. Right. I, this is this is the way that I would be finding out. If that's it, then I'm just going to drop down here to our last section here. Grab bag. Which is on evolving how we use our Kanban boards. Or an honest, totally unbiased discussion on how Andrew kicks the scrum can down the road. Because Andrew did not finish the scrum book like he thought he was going to. Uh, not even close. <laughs> so Which one was it? Was I'm it not going to do that. Uh, scrum? Yeah. Just, just scrum. Yeah. And so my thought is this. If we give an honest breakdown of what we set up for, for our cam board instance, and next week you and I, or next episode, excuse me, you and I go through the scrum book, we can see what their advice is versus what we implemented, what we agree with, what yeah. we don't agree with. Coming at this with un cluttered eyes right i can i can look at this and say this is this is legitimately my best effort to solve these problems that i have and i i think they will and i think i think this is the right way to solve them uh, and then we can come back in a couple of weeks and say well the prescription says this which is either in line or 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 not in line um, and then we can hopefully provide some kind of value between you know what we're doing and what has been prescribed in in the past over uh, over and beyond, you know, our expertise. So, um, plus, this is what I've been spending the majority of my time on trying to figure out, anyways. So, much like the Vim talk, I'm I'm taking what's been really eaten away at me, um, and and kind of putting it down on paper here as well. Additionally, um, I don't know how open I've been with this, but I am transitioning to a new new team at work i wouldn't even say i'm doing a whole bunch of uh, different things but that necessitates us creating a new board and relearning how to work with in in our case jira and and going through that and saying well what are our requirements you know how are we going to deal with some of these problems that crop up and as I've been going through that, setting this up, I've been looking at, you know, Jack, how you and I deal with this and, and saying, well, is this a similar problem or a different problem? Right. And, and I was able to narrow down into three problems that we're evolving to solve. Uh, and, and, and Jack, this is a discussion too. So like yeah. if, not even if, just when let's, let's, let's have, let's have this discussion. Yeah. Let's have this because we walked through a lot of this in our Q3 meeting and a lot of this is stuff that we both agreed should help the process, right? But I wanted to lay out a little bit of a detailed why is this going to help and I could be wrong, right? I, you could be coming at it from a completely different direction. So let's, let's use this to level set that. But um, the three problems that we're evolving to solve here is uh, the first problem being having a board that lies about the tasks that we're currently doing and their magnitude. All right, so so that's a that's a problem that we're evolving to solve. Uh, the second one here is not being able to visibly represent progress in a big task. And the last one is lack of focus on the big picture. So right off the rip there, any disagreements or anything I left out uh, in, as far as what we we're doing? No, I think that's what we discussed at the Q3 meeting. And then as well, what we discussed just this past Monday, even for, yep. I think we had priority complexity for this past week or maybe, yeah, priority complexity. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So uh, taking, taking a look at those, those three individually, just kind of diving into the implications of those. Uh, the first one is always going to be the hardest because having a board that lies about the tasks that you're currently doing and their magnitude is the biggest 
trap that you can fall in as as dealing with a with a board system because the temptation is always to just kind of leave it or explain it away or give a special caveat in your mind and say well actually that one's waiting on but i didn't mark it right. it'll be you know that is you have now enabled the board to lie to you right and the more the the more you do that the, the more you enable yourself to come up with excuses and to mislead yourself about what, what is actually going on. Right. Uh, as well, it, it also pulls up, you know, it, it puts in front of your face a, a to do list that you have to spend cognitive effort deciphering, right? The, the entire reason why we have time set aside to, jiggle the knobs i call it like zen gardening really i mean that's yeah that's what i'm doing i'm, I'm doing my tree. meditation yeah. by like moving these little things and saying how did this go last week you know and 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 getting my story straight so that when i come back to it in the middle of the week and have a half hour 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 and a half to dedicate to something i can say i know that i can look at that and i can pick up anything in there and it'll be something worth doing because it's in the column that says this is the column where stuff is worth doing, right? And it's above the other thing. Right. So this thing is more worth doing than the, the other, other thing. Right. So it's – I don't have to expand the cognitive effort outside of that time that Jack and I are able to sit down, come to the table and say, all right, whew, let's go over this again, right? How, how are we doing? And, and, and there's a whole bunch of discussion around that too. So we'll get to that in a second. Um, the, the second problem here, not being able to visibly represent progress in a big task, that is more of a long-term issue, uh, because obviously you can go in, you can create subtasks, you can check off subtasks, you can write comments, you know, you can make links, you can see the evolution of how a task is, is progressing, but there is nothing more visceral than being able to put something in the done column, right? To be able to say, I did that work. The work is valuable, the work is needed, and the work right. is now done. And and if you don't do that, no matter who you are, that becomes disheartening. You start looking at that and say, oh, that task, I know I've been Grinding chugging away, away at it. Right. But it's been out there for three weeks. Am I ever going to get it done? Four weeks, five weeks. Did I bite off too much? Am I stuck? Am I good enough to get this done? Right. You start to second guess yourself, and and you start to have all these, you know, negative experiences with with looking at this task. Whereas it should be simply a task. It should be simply a reminder of what needs to get done. Right. So if if you're not seeing any progress on that task from a board perspective. Even if you know inside of that task, uh, it could it could be a different story. Your visceral reaction is still going to be negative as well. You also are maintaining the board for other people, right? If you have anything other than a, a personal board, your your board is to represent your work in some way. So if you're not able to represent progress on a big task. Right. And, and usually that's done by splitting it up and we'll get to how that can be done in, in a, in a bit here. But if you're not able to represent progress on that task, then that perception is that there's no work getting done on that task. And that's not the perception you want to give because that's not the reality right. that's, that's out there. You want to give the real perception, which is that there is progress being done on this task. And we can talk about bigger tasks, uh, projects versus tasks and categories and stuff like that. But um, point blank, if tasks aren't moving, there's a problem. I agree with that. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the, the last problem is that I, I, I think this Jack and I experienced, you know, there was a noted lack of focus on the big picture as we were plugging away at these little onesie, twosie tasks, right, as we were... Uh, running into incidents, figuring those out, fixing those, moving on with trying to, you know, I, I, I said, you know, I spent two days trying to figure out this, this socket thing, right? That was a redirect of a, you know, subshell, 
right? So while I'm stuck in that, I'm not looking at all the, you know, three or four other features that I want to implement that I wouldn't be stuck on that. Maybe spending two days on those would actually get those completed, right? Versus where I'm at right now. Um, and, and that gives a, a good bit of context, but it also is a good Zen mentality to have, to be able to step back and say, Hey, you know what? There are, there is a bigger picture here, uh, than just this one task. And let me continue to focus on that as well. So, uh, those are the three problems I think that we, we were dying to solve and, we went about solving them in different ways. But before we dive into the implementation of, of how we solve that, I wanted to talk about complexity because I remember uh, back in our Camboard episodes, uh, we touched on complexity. We were talking about Fibonacci sequences yeah. and we were talking about why we use it. But I, I don't think we ever got a really good deep dive. So I wanted to take this opportunity to say why we're doing this. Uh, so, so Jack, I mean, you're you're probably taking a look at the notes right now. Yeah. Um, and you have a good idea of what complexity is. So why don't why don't you level set and then I will uh, come in behind you and and clarify a couple things. So what do you, uh, you want me to just read these points off here? What is complexity like? What uh, what do I define complexity as? I like how you put here. It's non. I'll just read them off here. It's uh, so sure. complexity is yeah. non-time based, which is necessary for knowledge work. It's a fee, so we use a Fibonacci sequence for uh, complexity, and then it's analogous to story analogous to story points, which you're gonna have to touch on that one. The first two I can definitely talk on. Uh, non-time based uh, can mean another a number of things, and what I, what it really means is, you know, this can be a very complex task, but we've already seen an issue like this before. So it ends up being something around. And I, I don't want to throw any numbers out there, um, or get too deep into examples, but you know, it kind of goes into that. Uh, I don't know if it's a quadrant series. It's known, 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 unknown, unknown, known, and unknown, unknown, which are kind of like those four types of, uh, situations or yeah problems you kind of encounter um so you know your known knowns are going to be stuff you're familiar with stuff you're kind of in and out of every day uh you know those are at the bottom of those sequences and for us it ends up going one two we usually just go one two three five eight uh 13 and really at 13 at that point it's being broken down into a smaller task because it's just infeasible kind of how you're talking about earlier you know, lack of, it, it's not lack of focus, but it's going to sit there forever. It, it's going to sit for a while if it's a 13, because you're probably doing something that you're not familiar with and you don't know what the end state is. And you really don't know, you don't have a tract of how to get there. Whereas, you know, you're running into your known knowns are going to be closer to the one or two or three. A uh, good example for us is just show notes i think we have marked as a two i believe it's something or maybe a one even it's something we have to do every week we it's a two we have to uh do them every week um just sit down pull down kind of an integration discussion or grab bag topic and then go through um just kind of articles we find interesting and then uh through our list of services for uh community updates and Basically, by going through, you know, this is not we have to do it every every week, so it's something we have to mark for that we're doing. But it's not we're not writing new features. We're not, you know, doing anything super complex. It just kind of ends up being account. It's accounted. It has to be accounted for in this way. But it's there's no time to there's no time time base. You know, some weeks it could I it, I could sit down and write it and say, oh yeah, this is you know very easy but some weeks you know it may it may end up being a little bit longer because you know we just end up doing a deeper dive but um did you want to talk about story points a little bit or did you have anything you wanted to add in there with that i will yeah no i'll transition to that for sure but but to wrap up what you were saying i mean what 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 you're describing is is the benefit of the 
Fibonacci sequence, or at least the the detail, the implementation of the the Fibonacci sequence, and and we do that because it's easy to differentiate just mentally. If you were to just take a guess, right, as to like how hard this would be on a scale from one to thirteen, right, it's easier to say take a guess on a scale from one to thirteen, but only of Use these five numbers, numbers right? right? One, two, three, five, eight, and thirteen, right. because you. You can see how it it starts to get more and more complex. Well, it gets bigger, ex- almost. The more it gets bigger, yeah, yeah. It's not exponential, but at that low rate, it almost is. Whereas the other system would be, you know, rate this from one to ten. Well, a one to a three can mean the same. You know, oh, anywhere from one to three could be the same thing. And then I would argue four to six is the same, and then seven to ten. That can mean anything. And then at that point, you start you start politicizing a lot of that because you're, you're like, all right, what actually takes prioritize? And yeah, yeah. So so a Fibonacci sequence is kind of makes it easier. Uh, and and I don't know if this is just a, a knowledge work thing or or stuff that's not necessarily time bound or time constrained, but it's it's a lot easier to say. Yeah, I absolutely see where, you know, I would I would estimate something would be like a, a 5 out of 13, right? But then I add one new feature and it gets bumped up to an 8 because I necessarily now have to do much more testing. Right. I have to do testing on all the other things along with this new thing. I have to do all the implementation. You know, it, it's it's more changes for everything else I'm doing. So it it just necessarily starts making those jumps the bigger and bigger it gets, right? Even a small incremental, you know, addition to whatever job you have to perform means it's necessarily it's, it's complexity starts skyrocketing. And, and really that's why I think it's such a good word here and a, and a good field to use because it's not saying this is going to take me twice as long to complete. I'm saying, the amount of effort I'm going to have to put in here is going to, you know, increase by 40% um, or, 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 you know, what, whatever it is using these numbers, you can similarly, you can use percentages or you can use whatever you want. Um, I, I do like this because it avoids that linear trap of, of humans are better estimating when there are bigger gaps between higher level changes. I, I, I've just always found that to be the case. And I think you and I have a good level set on that. And it does come with experience. Right. If you start integrating this, if you start saying, yeah, I'm going to start using, you know, complexity or story points or whatever you have, and I'm going to use a Fibonacci sequence, you're going to be pretty bad at estimating. At uh, the beginning, what, totally. How, how, how big something is, right? Yeah. And and you're going to you're gonna go on and you say, I remember, you know, doing something this large before and, it took me a lot longer than all of my other tasks that I would categorize as like a level three, right? So I'm going to categorize this as a level five, you know, and, and kind of bump that up. And, and, and so that's just the way it's an internal way. It's not a quantifiable way, but it's, it's a way for us to put our assumptions into number. Right. Uh, and, and we do that because, we don't want to track hours based on that it's because uh, I was just listening to the latest Cortex episode and CGP, CGP Grey had a great little rant right in the middle of the episode. He was talking about he thought he had a fact. He had a fact that this date was the first date that something was ever done. It was like, you know, this was... Like the first shovel was used at this date, right? He's like, this is, this is a fact. And then someone said, uh, actually, no, there's this other thing. And so he started doing a deep dive that took him three months and like different, I I don't think he was traveling at that point, but like three months and like several different libraries and, and going around finding all these other different manuscripts and things point to things that referenced other things. And the reason they thought it was this date and someone had referenced that book was because it was actually a copy of that book that had a footnote by some other author in that book. And then that footnote pointed back to something else. And, and he was just like, I am literally just rabbit trailing, trying to figure out what the first 
date of this shovel was. It wasn't a shovel, but it was something. But, you know, what, what this date was, because I thought I had a fact, and then the bottom completely fell out under me. And at any given time, that could happen to us. And while it doesn't necessarily change the complexity because it's it's a rabbit hole within the larger field. Like, I got an idea of how big this field is, but these rabbit holes can go real deep. deep right. Right? I could, I could really trip and end up way underground. Uh, and, and so then I got to dig my way back up. And that could just just cost me a lot of time right and also we can also relate complexity back to actual value actual features actual remediations and stuff that gets done too so there's a different component of this where you also have to take into account why you're doing this right it's not just how long it takes because i can do nothing for 40 hours a week i've proven to myself i can do that but if i want to add value something that complexity takes into account is the value Added. of the ecosystem right. that you're contributing to right. yeah um and i'm i'm not gonna dive into story points because i'm not 100 percent sure on them but the way i understand them is the same kind of way that complexity works um but they are sp it's specific to scrum um, and so I'm going to leave that off until next episode where Jack does a book review for us that I put off doing. Okay. Okay. So, um, we'll see, we'll see what kind of definition and, and honestly I am because I, I, I had to go through that entire ramble to come up with a definition for complexity. So I'm hoping that they have a better way to explain story points than, than I do complexity. The way I kind of... I'll save it, but the just real quick, the way I kind of understand story points for right now, which may is probably very subject to change, is uh, business value for – it sounds like there's epics, there's stories within epics, and then there's tasks within stories maybe or something like that, and each task gets assigned story points. Anyway, I don't want to go any deeper than that, but um, did you want to talk about completed complexity and – Kind of the three things to track yeah, and, with that. And, and just kind of how we're using this complexity. So so obviously we have the system to rank and and measure, you know, a a an amorphous number as to how big of a task we think we're completing, right? This this is the way to measure knowledge work, right? It's kind of the best system I've seen work actually work before. Our base accounting does not work. So how do we measure it now, right? So Camboard uh, has the ability to run plugins, uh, as, as we went over in our plugin discussion, and I have written one that uh, is fairly remedial. I mean, you can look at the JavaScript. It's not doing anything fancy, but it goes through the various columns and totals up uh, the complexity in those columns per week, right? So what I want to find out is between Jack and I, how much complexity can we do a week? You can start to see where this would be eminently valuable when we start estimating when we can bring features to completion or, or when we can have remediations in place or or really how much work can we realistically do because the biggest pet peeve of mine is saying that you can do everything and not trying to sacrifice anything right. for that right at that point you're just lying to yourself and others so to avoid being a liar you're going to have to measure how much you can actually get done, right? So so what we did is we just decided let's start measuring this. Uh, we measured a Q2, right? Um, per our measurements and per our estimations and how we use the board and how we accounted for things, we got to, uh, between the two of us, 15 complexity per week on average. Um, and that's a generous average, but and uh, the, the the average that we saw from the numbers and 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 they were hard numbers. They were all over the place, right? They weren't as consistent as I would like to see. Yeah, but they were still something more than nothing. And I think you bring up that 
good point that they weren't consistent. I think with Q3, at least the way we have it kind of marked, is that we're tracking week by week. We're moving over complexity into a done column week by week rather yeah. than waiting on all the 8s and 13s out there to close on a week. And it just so happened a lot of ours closed within the same week period where it's like, all right, you get a week with zero complexity done, then you get the next week with like 40 done. It's just all over the place. Just It's not a consistent number across the board. It's inconsistent. Yeah, which is, which is coming back to our discussion about not being able to visibly represent progress in a big task, right? This is also addressing that progress week to week, right? So we'll, we'll go over splitting and recomplexitizing when we talk about the priority and complexity meeting. Uh, but basically the, the mechanism that we have in place to address that is to say, if we have one of those big tasks that's just been hanging out, let's kind of note down in a way that's sustainable how much work has been done on that this week right. so we can get that logged, you know, in, in a way that still makes sense when we talked about complexity and we talk about, you know, these individual tasks and uh, work that needs to get done. Uh, now, we do measure it per team and not per person yet. So I can't tell you, you know, that uh, for the first half, Jack, you know, averaged 30 and I averaged 10 and the second half. Jack averaged five and I averaged 20 or something like that. That's not, that's not how that works, right? We're just every week as a team, we're doing that. Now, that is actually a paradigm in the agile ecosystem, as I understand it, right? The, the agile ecosystem likes to say everyone works in a team. So you have to measure your metrics as a team, right? Now that is shaky ground. Uh, for me to stand on, especially if you want to say, am I getting better? Am I getting worse? Am I contributing enough? You know, et cetera, et cetera. What's, what's my workload look like? You know, am I failing because I have too much on my plate? Am I failing because I don't have enough on my plate? You know, what, what is going on here? So getting down into those individual metrics may be helpful, but I also don't want to, and, and this is the main rationale in the agile ecosystem is I don't want to get down into the blame game, right? I don't want to be finger pointing. I don't right. want the five right. whys to become the five blames, you know? So we, we, we want to make sure that we're not doing that. And luckily, you know, talk about organizational debt as a team of two, we kind of both understand we can, where we stand right. in relation to each other. Very easily. Like, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to kid around, but we're going to say as a team, we're going to average this much a week, right? And then if I start taking on more or if I start taking on less and we, we go through and we see that something is helping and something is not helping, then we're going to keep pushing in that direction, right? And we're able to to make those incremental changes given this system right we're able to get that feedback and and readapt um, which leads me to my next point is that you want to be eventually consistent right you want to see what works you want to see hey you know are we evening out right are we able to get the same amount of work done in complexity per week whereas before you're like did you get the same amount of work done right if you're not tracking it right if you're not tracking it you don't know not only am I not tracking it, if I'm tracking it via hours, I don't know. What What do you mean the same work? Well, yeah, I, mean, I did different things than I did right, last week. Right. <laughs> How do you, without using some kind of non-time-based system, you cannot track what a unit of work is. There's no, you know, unit of work. Like, there, you don't have that. Yeah. Not in the way we, we, we do this. So, coming to it and saying, hey... We're going to use complexity per team. We're going to become eventually consistent with it, right? And uh, we're going to we're going to take a stab at predicting some of the things that we can do. So, like last quarter average, what we were talking about, we're now able to set our maintenance tasks, and we're able to say, okay, I know every week I'm going to have this much in maintenance to do, just things that I have to do every week, whether it's recording this podcast every two weeks. Or putting together a video on the off weeks, you know, Jack's doing outreach. We're going to have these maintenance tasks and they're going to take up a set amount per week 
of our knowledge work allocation that we can use. How much is that work based on complexity that we can we can compare apples to apples and say, I've got leftover complexity given our previous average. Let me allocate that towards uh, improvements or towards remediating bugs or bug fixes, stuff like that. So we're able to, with complexity, we're able to say what a unit of work is. We're able to compare apples to apples and we're able to say, let's move in a positive direction when we consider what what a business plan should look like when it comes to, you know, what, what features should we implement? You know, what, what bugs do we need to fix? You know, what, what are our goals going to be for Q3? And are they obtainable, right? Are, are, are what we set out to do the right things to, to set out to do? You know, is it, is it something that we can feasibly accomplish? And if the, the question is, I don't know, right? Can you, can you help me out? If, if the answer to that question is, is I don't know, right? I have no clue how to measure work. Right. This is not a good answer. Not a good answer. So how did we answer these questions? Uh, the first thing I think was very interesting is we set up two meetings. Previously, it was three meetings, which were actually two meetings. So we were we were able to uh, to kind of not down. Uh, what, what's what's the word I'm looking for? We were able to to smush, which is not the word I'm looking for, but we were able to to compress. smush and, and divvy up that that other meeting. Sure, sure, compress uh, and and get to a standard of of two smush. here. So. Uh, I like to, I like to think of these as, um, not necessarily in Ruberos, but like a double of Ruberos, because we have two cycles going on at at one time, which is part of a, an overarching cycle. So we have one where we want to bring new tasks on. We want to say, all right, what's a new project? You know, what what can we add? What is the next thing to work on? Like, I just finished that socket thing, which means, you know, Jack's Ruby piece is up next, right? When do we say that is now prioritized? How, how do we bring that on, right? And then the other part of it is, how do we go back and review what's been completed? Because like I said it before, you know, the, the second problem here is that we haven't been able to visibly represent progress in a big task. And the reason that's a problem is because it really does give a very good way to motivate yourself to say, I got something done. That feels awesome. Right. Right. So we, we have to have that review. Um, so I was I, I, I separated those out. And the first one, the, the prioritization one, right? We're going to want to check for any tasks that have not been assigned to complexity. We want to make sure everything's complexitized. Um, and we want to replenish the tasks from the backlog. So we want to we want to prioritize anything from our idea backlog. Say, I want to do this someday. Well, someday's today. So I'm going to grab that and, and bring that up. Uh, Repre replenishing those tasks so that we have the total amount of complexity that we can spare between our average complexity and our weekly weekly maintenance that ends up at about 10 per week right so we we bring on those tasks that have been previously complexitized now the problem here is what if i didn't get something done right what if i didn't finish that socket program right what if i only got like everything up to the Python script done and said, I, I'm, I'm still stuck on this Python script thing, right? I, I, I can get the socket, you know, to the container. I can mount it in there. Um, I've got it connecting to the host. I can send data across it, but I cannot get systemd to call this Python program. What do I do? And what I do in this scenario is I say, all right, well, let's break this piece of work up. Let's right. break it up into what I've done and what still has to be done, which now means that I can move what's been done into done and I can celebrate that. I can say, look, you know what? I did a lot of the stuff that needed to be done, right? I, I was able to to make that socket work. I was able to to make that system D uh, call run, um, but I, I can't get the Python program. So the Python program is still chilling here. But what used to be one task like eight or yeah right yeah go ahead what used to be one task that was an eight complexity 
is now something that I can throw over. I can throw, let's call it three complexity over to the side and I'm left over with a five here, right? Now I, I don't want my board to lie to me. If I were to keep those together, it would still say that for the next two weeks I'm faced with a eight complexity, right? Which is, I know internally is not the case because I've already worked through a lot of the, the roadblocks that I've, I've been put up against and I've gotten a lot of that done. So I will have room left over to, to do some other things. And I want to continue to bring those new things on. How do I not let that board lie to me? Well, I split it up into the truth, which is I've truthfully done this part of it. And I truthfully haven't done this part of it. So if I move that out to done, I can celebrate what's been done. And I and can say, hey, right. honestly, I've got five complexity left. Right. Which is a much better, which is a much better representation of what, the way the task operates, because you essentially you're breaking it down at that point. All right, you have three done and you have five left. All right, well now it's only a five task. It's not an eight task anymore. I, I have run into that issue before uh, in the past, where it's like, all right, I'm on an eight eight task here, and something's just stuck. Right? There's code that's been produced, but essentially it's part of it's done, and then you just get roadblocks. Like, all right, I still have this eight task out there basically instead of looking at it well three's already done or five's already done now all i have left is a three complexity so i think it's a much better way to represent what gets done per week and it also keeps it consistent for metrics yes yeah absolutely and that that lets us uh note that work that has been done um that week and then bring on the rest of it for the for the following week uh, and then, like Jack said, we can recomplexitize. But, you know, viscerally, I know you were able to do that last week, right? And you were able to take an 8 down to a 1 because you had done most of it, or an 8 down to a 2 or something like that, right? Uh, a 5 down to a 1. A 5 down to a 1. You yeah. Did, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, and you just had that one thing to work on. And mentally, what did that feel like when you looked at that again to say, hey, this is only a 1 now? Um, honestly, I was kind of mad at myself because it should have been done. Uh, the five should have been done, but there was just something with the helper functions that I just couldn't get the night before. And I, it was just something that was, wasn't eating away at me or very, I, I just had to do a lot more, yeah. a little bit more digging than I anticipated. Um, but you know, it always feels good to move stuff to done though, right? It does. So. It does. It feels so good. You know, and, and even, when I did mine, I think I took my eight down to a two or something like that. When I when I yeah. threw that six into done, that feels good. good. Yeah. But even coming back to it, I'm like, you know what? I've got I've got enough energy to tackle this two now, right? I I'm coming to it. If I were to see it before, I would. Oh, I spent so much time on that on that eight, right? I'm still plugging away at it. It's still an eight. That it's really bummed me out. But after after. You know, admitting to myself, yeah, I, I got that done. Let me let me kick it over to done. I'm able to to recommit it and say, you know what, you're not such a big problem after all. You know, I can I can tackle you. You know, felt felt better about that. So, um, I I'm interested to see if that continues on. If yeah. that trend, like yeah. if if that motivation continues, because that's that's pretty cool to know that, um, you know, autonomy, mastery, purpose to know that I do have mastery over this, even though, you know, it, it may feel like I'm going nowhere. Let me visually represent what, what I've been able to master. Yeah. Uh, and then the next meeting we have is our retro and review. Uh, so in there we go over the completed complexity report, uh, just kind of saying, Hey, did we get what we needed to say done? And then we can start tracking our averages, you know, and see if we are accurately representing, you know, what, what we said we're going to do. Um, also reviewing completed improvement tasks and the roadmap parents. I didn't get into roadmap parents a lot. I don't think I'm going to at this stage, um, but we do have a uh, task linking that I have down here that I'm not, I know I'm not going to be able to get to, but you know, our roadmap is supposed to be a status at a glance uh, that will be public in the next two weeks, according to the task that I have in progress now. <laughs> And that roadmap uh, is full of links back to our tasks that now that we're 
breaking stuff off, you know, is giving a more accurate representation of how much more we have to go on those roadmap tasks. So, and, and that's in real time. That's not a, what I want to avoid. And, you know, as, as I got, yeah, as, as I started the, the scrum book, I mean, the big thing is, you know, the waterfall method, right? The starting is let's plan everything at the beginning and then go from there, right? This flips that entirely on its head and says every week we get to reevaluate what's what, important, what we're doing, right? Right. So, so we're able to get an accurate, up to date assessment of what it looks like here. Um, and then we also review overdue tasks, which is going to be a conversation starter. Um, I want to talk about overdue tasks and forced upkeep. I don't have a whole lot of time, but I want to go over them really quickly. So, overdue tasks. Um, we do have that grace period, the way we structure our every other week meetings, right? We have that grace period of seven days before an overdue task is noted on the priority meeting. So we review it on the uh, retro and review meeting. So if that gets completed by that point, I mean, we're, we're done. Like I don't, I, that's already been take into account with the complexity. I don't have to re-review it, but if it's still there, we want to go in and say, all right, well, why has this not been done? Right. Let's, let's have that conversation. Um, and let's note down that conversation too in the comments. Right. Um, and then do due dates, due dates. Well, uh, you know, a little bit of a tongue twister our, our, there. Nice. Are, are the way we're using due dates function um, as, as we're expecting them to? Because what due dates are to us now are a reminder that, hey, you promised that this would be done on this date. Is it, is it done? Right? right. And then if it's, if it's not done, then we can say, all right, do we need to push it out another two weeks? Do we need to split it? You know, have you gotten any work done on it? Uh, do we need to push this back, right? And previously, I mean, there would have been no reason for us to review that because the due date wasn't there. Right. I mean, sure, the task could have been marked in the column as, you know, three days, but that's after it spent 27 in, in waiting, right. Right? right? Just the way that columns work. So what are we going to do when we have a due date come due? And what we're going to do is we're going to have a conversation about it, right? We're going to say, what, what do we need to, what do we need to have happen here? Um, now that conversation is going to start in the priority meeting because we're going to split and recomplexitize it. Right. Right. But the due date's still going to be there and say, Hey, we this, this was actually still due, you know, previously, but it's, you know, it's, it's not going to keep you from starting other work. And that's what I never want to, I never want to create false impediments using this kind of system. I never want to say, don't start on something new. I never want to say, don't pick up something right, else. Right. Um, you know, you have to get this done before anything else, because that's, that's a recipe for disaster, right? What you're going to want to do is you're going to want to start and uh, start whatever you can um, within your power to. And, and your, your power to is the amount of complexity that you can handle a week, right? That's, that's how the system works. You're able to start, you're able to know what you're able to do, right? You, you've taken something that used to be an unknown unknown, and you're able to make it a known known. You're able to say, I can complete this amount of complexity in this amount of time period versus I don't know how big this work is going to be. And I don't know what it would usually take for me to complete it. And, and that's all we're trying to do here. We're, we're, we're trying to keep ourselves accountable to, to stay in that known, known state. Right. Um, and then the last thing here is talking about accountability. I mean, we're forcing ourselves to do our own upkeep here, you know, because we're, we're getting hit with our own reports, right? We're, we're getting with our own red due dates and we're saying, oh crap, that looks not Overdue. great. Right, right. Right. And my hope is that everything that we do f is much like a Kanban system is a pull method, right? Sure. This, this forced pull method 
make sure that we have the the incentives to keep revisiting the things we need to revisit like completed tasks right to close out the roadmap tasks it forces us to look at the backlog to say i need 10 complexity i don't have anything left in the backlog let me go back to the roadmap i don't know what to prioritize let me go back to the goals document right and what do we have planned for the quarter right so we're able to review all of those those projects that we you know or, or those those plans that we we put together to said hey big picture is this is what we wanted to get done right and by depleting the things that we have in there and and by putting constraints and goals you know small term goals for ourselves and reviewing those and splitting recomplexitizing we're able to force our own hands to say i don't have to remember to do anything because as a natural consequence of this system, I will be reviewing everything that I need to. Now, of course, that's going to be the goal for any kind of system. You're going to want to... It's upkeep. To, it, at the end of the yeah. day, it's upkeep. It's a system. You have yeah. to tune it. You have to... There's maintenance that has to occur, whether it's you know preventative or you're upgrading is kind of how I look at it. I don't know if that's what you were thinking or if, if you think along the same lines, but... You have to do the ma- you have to put in the maintenance work for the system to keep working, right? Yep. Yeah, and and hopefully this will force us to or not even force us as a natural evolution of the minimal amount of things that we've agreed to do, which is sit down once a week, right, and follow like three steps in each of those meetings. And once we're done with those three steps, we're done. It could take us half an hour. Right. It could take us twenty minutes, right? right? We're done. If we need to spend more time on something, we can. But we will know that there is not something that I have forgotten to do because anything that I would need to do would be a natural consequence of the actions that we take. Now, that's any kind of system, right? That's the way that you want to go about solving technical debt, solving organizational debt, doing restructuring, you know, figuring out how to work within a system, right? And, and that means we have to find a way to do more with less, right? We need these systems in place to continue to push us to, to do more with, with just letting them work the way they need to, right? And believe it or not, we, we actually have a lot of experience doing this and you know we're continuing to evolve we're continuing you know none of none of us are perfect neither of us are perfect right but if you're you know if you're if you're looking to systematize you know your your creativity channel your passions right whatever other cliches you know that that you're trying to accomplish here um first thing you need to do is go to arcompose.com Sign up for the mailing list. That's where you're going to get all of these as we go through these, as we're walking through the the evolution of of what this is becoming, right? Uh, all of our all of our podcasts, all right, all of our integration session videos, um, all of our internal communication, right? This is all going to be what you're going to need to be aware of as you start on this journey, right? And then we'll go from there. So. That being said, we hope you enjoyed this episode of our Composecast. Thank you, be safe, and we'll see you all in two weeks. Bye, everybody.